Anyhow, but the point is that these medicines treat only symptoms and the disease continues unabated underneath it, correct? They're only treating symptoms and they let off on the medicines and they're worse and they think, well, you know, I've got to stay with the medicine. The other thing I find is really interesting is there are a couple of, of anti-Parkinsonian medications that, I, that are people are using that I happen to think are, are awful medications. And I ask patients, are you benefited by that drug? And they say, no, but my doctor told me to keep taking it. And I think to myself, why are you taking it if you don't even know if it works? You know, there's this whole thing where they try to look, they try to develop these studies of the, for example, the dopamine agonists to see if, well, maybe they're having some effect on the disease progression. And they don't, but yet somehow that slips into the literature. So it's, it's always interesting how once something sort of is mentioned in the literature, it sort of takes hold. And it, it's very interesting to know that more than 70%, according to Dr. Jerry Avorn at Harvard, more than 70% of the information doctors gleaned from reading medical journals comes from the advertisements. So there's, you know, we talk about direct-to-consumer advertising. Well, it's, this direct-to-physician advertising uh, is very, very powerful. So when we look at patients, I want to think of a couple things. The brain on fire and also this change in genetic expression. Well, let's look at these pro-inflammatory cytokines. They enter the nucleus and actually lead to the induction of these toxic genes, which uh, lead to inflammation and actually apoptosis. Apoptosis is this pre-programmed sequence that leads to neuronal death. This is the connection between inflammation and neuronal death. Ultimately, when uh, these glial cells are activated, cytokines are produced that then bind to the surface. They activate these transduction systems, which actually turns on the genes for um, inducible nitric oxide synthase and COX-2 enzyme leading to death. So um, we can actually measure cytokines and control in the tan and Parkinson's on the, in the blue, measure these inflammatory cytokines in the area of the brain that degenerates in the Parkinson's patient. So this is very clear that inflammation is playing an important role. That's what we need to think about when this Parkinsonian patient comes into our office, that his brain is on fire. When these microglia are activated, uh, this system happens. So we have to ask ourselves, let's take a close look at what is it that activates these microglia? What turns them on? Well, glucose is a very important player. Um, you know, we have a, a big problem in this country. Um, not that on the upper right corner Jack Nicholson is acting his age, but that diabetes is a big problem. 18 million Americans, probably a lot, <clears throat> probably a lot more, probably closer to 22 million Americans. Um, 1.3 million new cases annually. Well, what is the relationship uh, between um, diabetes and, um, and the brain? We'll get to that. This was published uh, in the New England Journal of Medicine uh, last month, looking, just demonstrating this huge increase in incidence over time. Probably you won't have this in your, this was just published, over time of, of diabetes and a direct relationship between diabetes and brain degeneration because of this simple fact. That elevated blood sugar changes proteins. Blood sugar binds to the amino end of the amino acids in, in proteins and changes them. It simply changes the conformation of the protein, making it more uh, inflammatory. When you look at uh, uh, the effect, that you see that in this study that there's a dramatic increase, 50-fold increase in the production of free radicals, of proteins that have been glycated or modified by glucose compared to those that have not been. So here they're calling for pharmacologic, pharmaceutical approaches which change this vicious cycle of oxidative stress and neurodegeneration. This is a call for pharmaceutical antioxidants, as if we don't have plenty of great antioxidants right now. Advanced glycosylated end product inhibitors, antioxidants, anti-inflammatory, uh, can, this is an implication for reducing dementia called to us by the European Archives of Psychiatry. So let's look how this works. We can, the RAGE uh, is the receptor for these advanced glycosylated end products, the receptor for these modified proteins. When you have this protein, or AGE, advanced glycosylated, a protein modified by glucose, and it binds to its receptor, something very interesting happens, and this happens in the brain. It turns on the production of messenger RNA for COX-2 enzyme, which then increases the production of COX-2. So this is the relationship between diabetes and inflammation in the brain and in the rest of the body. That glycated proteins, like glycohemoglobin, we all measure the glycohemoglobin, that's a glycated protein, increases inflammation and here's the mechanism.
But interestingly enough, uh, in this study, if you use a, uh, a ligand to bind to the rage receptor, in this case S100B, which binds the receptor and should turn on this process, but if you pre-treat in the laboratory this milieu with N-acetylcysteine, you have a dramatic reduction in the level of COX-2 enzyme production. And this is why NAC has been looked at so vigorously, one of the reasons, uh, in addition to being a uh, stimulating uh, glutathione production, why NAC has a role to play in, par in Parkinson's and also in Alzheimer's. Has it been tested? Sure it has. Uh, this is published in Neurology. That's the American Academy of Neurology's journal, where they gave NAC to Alzheimer's patients and found that they pr pr uh, progress much more slowly on every measurable outcome measurement compared to those who have not gotten it. So why doesn't every neurologist consider using NAC? Why do I have, why do I use NAC and CoQ10 and alpha lipoic acid and B12 and DHA in my protocols? Because the peer review science says it's the best thing going. Uh, this is a journal looking at the effect of diabetes on the hippocampus in rats. The hippocampus is the memory center. I was um, recently flying to give a lecture uh, to, in New York, actually last week, and I had the Journal of the American Medical Association there, and the man sitting next to me said, the Journal of the American Medical Association, can I read your JAMA? And I said, um, yeah, sure. And I, I was kind of glad I wasn't reading this journal, because then he would have said, can I, can I look at your... Um, Pina, so I, uh, <laughs> anyway, <laughs> that's Proceedings of the National Academy of Science. Uh, nonetheless, when they, when they give uh, this streptazosin to uh, rats, they produce these changes in the hippocampus, in the specific area of the brain that makes, that deals with our memory and emotion. So diabetes specifically targets the area of the brain called the hippocampus, which is the first area to degenerate in Alzheimer's. Very, very important. It's why diabetic patients decline mentally. Modified amyloid. Amyloid is this protein involved in, uh, that we talk about in Alzheimer's disease, and it gets changed by being modified by glucose. That turns on the microglia. If you have diabetes, your risk of dementia is 400% increased. This looks at your brain volume based upon glycohemoglobin. The higher the glycohemoglobin, the less brain you have. Now, what could be a stronger call to us to pay attention to diabetes and glucose um, uh, control than you, when you tell somebody, look, your brain is going to degenerate in relation to your glycohemoglobin. I think more powerful than this is probably the commercials we're seeing on TV now for ED, where they have a guy who says, I'm diabetic and I'm at risk for ED. So, I mean, I think that makes people much more concerned about being diabetic. Unfortunately, uh, this is the thing that really gets people into trouble because, you know, they become demented and can't control themselves. We can look at insulin resistance and compare it to cognitive impairment. Uh, early in type 2 diabetes... Uh, Mellitus, uh, we have what's called insulin resistance, where the, the cells are resistant to the effects of insulin. Actually, insulin levels go up. So this is what we call uh, insulin resistance, the insulin resistance syndrome. And in this study, they looked at mental testing on individuals. And simply what they found is if you have cognitive impairment and what are called subcortical features, like increased reflexes, Parkinsonian symptoms, the risk of you having insulin resistance is very, very great. But interestingly enough, elevated insulin actually produces more beta amyloid in your body and in your brain, and also uh, increased amounts of these inflammatory mediators. So insulin itself increases inflammation. And when they gave saline versus insulin, you can look at tumor necrosis factor alpha, IL-6, and there's a corresponding rise in beta amyloid production. So insulin, hyperinsulinemia, when people become insulin resistant, it increases inflammatory mediators in their brains. Moderate hyperinsulinemia can elevate inflammatory markers and beta amyloid. So this increases the risk for Alzheimer's disease. And this is that beta amyloid. You know, in the old days, we used to think of beta amyloid as <clears throat> this protein in the brain that was sort of like the detritus or the tombstone of degenerated neurons. We now know that beta amyloid is a very active protein because it in, in, it in of itself becomes glycated and that increases the production of these inflammatory mediators. So these collections of beta amyloid that we see are little nidises, little fires that are burning, that are increasing inflammation. So it's very important. 